Good evening. My name is Lauren Anderson, and I am the Manager of Alumni Relations at Johnson & Wales University. Thank you for joining us for tonight's session, Sip with Jaywoo, prepping for a new year with Bubbly. We are excited to bring this program to you virtually, so together we can learn about sparkling wines from different parts of the world. Before we get started, I'd like to review a few housekeeping items. This session is being recorded and will be available for future viewing. With the exception of the presenters, all participants have been muted. Please leave your cameras turned off until the tasting portion of the presentation. When directed, if you would like to turn your camera on, please do so. If you'd like to ask a question, please use the chat bu button at the bottom of your screen. We will refer to this section to take questions at the conclusion of the presentation. Set your view to side-by-side -side view in the top right corner of your screen. This will be the best way to see our presenter and his presentation. You are able to control the ratio of both views using the sizing bar in the middle of the views. Since we can't be together for this program, please keep it social. Feel free to share pictures of your at-home setup, a selfie or photo of who you are enjoying this session with. Be sure to tag at JWU alumni in your posts on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. I'd like to introduce tonight's presenter, Mark DiMarchena, proud JWU alum from the class of 1988 and associate professor within the College of Food Innovation and Technology, where he teaches foundation and capstone courses within the beverage world. Some courses he teaches are foundations of wine, spirits mixology management, contemporary restaurant operations management, and Somalia capstone. He has also led student study abroad programs to Europe, the Azores, and Madeira. Mark is a long-standing member of the Society of Wine Educators, where he serves as a member of their board of directors and where he earned his cert certified wine educator and certified specialist of spirits achievements. Mark holds additional certifications, including Bordeaux tutor and beer server from the Cicerone organization. Prior to joining the faculty at Johnson & Wales University in 1988, Professor DiMarchena managed food and beverage operations at a variety of hotels, national parks, and inns across the US. His involvement in the food and beverage industry spans four decades and has afforded him the opportunity to work with great teams, creating unique dining moments and profitable businesses. We are so grateful to have him and his level of knowledge at Johnson & Wales, and I am so thrilled to have him with us e this evening. Please join me in welcoming Professor DiMarchena. Mark, I'm gonna have you unmute. Oh, is that better? All right. I love talking when no one can hear you. That's more fun that way. Hi, everyone. Welcome. It's nice to have you here at Johnson & Wales on a lovely Wednesday night. We're anticipating some snow, so we should make some of our own snow inside with some fabulous bubbles. I'm going to put on a little PowerPoint and sort of have it go simultaneously with our tasting so we can get a little bit of information and have a little bit of something in our glass as we're moving along. Just so you know, you're on the third floor of the Cuisinart Culinary uh, Excellence Building here in Providence, Rhode Island. And I'm really excited to share some bubbles with you long distance. I hope you did your purchasing and that you're excited to have a little sip with us tonight. So let's get these screens arranged. If you'll just bear with me for a second. And while I'm doing this, if you could um, share your screens, I can, on my lower computer screen, I can see, I think I can see about 15 or 20 people all at once. So if you can share your screens, very good. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you very much. And that way we can sort of move along together. Yeah, that way it's not just like talking to the TV and you're like, hey, is anybody out there? Awesome. Now that you have your screens shared, and have I shared my screen properly, Laura? <laughs> Lauren, thank you. Awesome, just uh, working out all the technology. I would like you, if you could, to get things rolling, let's open up our first bottle of wine. Do you have your bubbly available, ladies and gentlemen? So our first selection is gonna be the Barefoot Bubbly. It's a Brut Reserve. 
Uh, it's a fabulous sparkling wine by the Gallo folks, and I'll talk about it a little bit further uh, in a moment. But if you can remove the foil at the top and get access to the, the key to the graph, I always suggest that you have your thumb on top as the safety, because this has got three times as much pressure as your car tire in it. So it's very, shall we say, dangerous if we don't operate, uh, open it properly. I have had the joy of getting hit in the head in a restaurant, so we're gonna be careful tonight. If you would turn this key six times counterclockwise, six half turns counterclockwise, and the cage loosens up. Now, I don't waste any time trying to take the cage off because that's usually when the cork will try to sneak out. So I just make a fist on top of the cage and then I like to hold the bottom of the bottle because that gives me more grip for twisting and opening. Let me know if I'm going too fast. I see some people are going step by step. That's awesome. So a lot of people try to turn the cork and that's kind of hard. So just hold the cork in place. The bottle's at a 45 degree angle and then twist it away from you and towards you. And that should loosen the cork now, some corks are wise guys, and they just try to get out of the bottle as fast as possible. But by having your hand here, you're ready to hold on to that, and so you won't be surprised. Some are more stubborn. This one's being stubborn. It's my workout for the day. I didn't do a walk in the 23 degree weather, so this is my workout. And we want to try and control that it doesn't shoot out too fast, because that will leave the wine being spilled. Whew. There we go. Smoke it. So our first bottle of bubbles is open. Please pour yourself a glass. Yeah, I like to see those bottles moving across the screen. Whenever you pour sparkling wine, you always have to be careful and do it patiently. I know it's usually at the beginning of an event, so it's hard to be patient because we've probably worked hard all day, but you don't want to overflow it. So first of all, let's say goodbye to 2020 and Prepare to welcome 2021. So just take a quick sip. Cheers to everyone. I think we should do this every Wednesday. That's perfect. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Bam. So this stuff that's in this glass, and um, I'm seeing some awesome little bubbles working up the glass. This is a special glass, of course. And I mean, it doesn't mean it's the only way to drink it. I'm going to drink most of mine in these smaller glasses that we use for tasting at Johnson & Wales. But we're in a whole other category of wine. It's really cool. And that's kind of facetious or kind of being clever. But sparkling wine comes from cool places around the globe. And because of that, it's really crisp. It makes our mouth salivate. So take another sip. Move it around. Wow, that slide went fast. Anyways, and ask yourself, what's your mouth doing after you have swallowed that wine? Is it dry? Or does your mouth, mouth start to salivate a little bit? And I think the salivation that you might be experiencing is a sign that this is a crisp wine. That makes it really yummy with light foods. So I'm gonna park my wine to the side. We'll talk a little bit more about barefoot in a second. Is everybody enjoying their first sip? I see smiles. It's the only way to do a wine tasting, smiles and sipping and smithing and smiles. And then the smiles get bigger as the sipping gets extensive and it just gets crazy. And we are recording this. So we're gonna share this with everybody's family later. So hold on, please. Anywho, so my little slide here shows you the magic of winemaking. We've been doing this for 10,000 years. I guess 10,000 years ago, they didn't have HBO, so they had to come up with something fun to do. Um, if I had some yeast at the house, I might try it in my house currently, but take some grapes, take some yeast, put them in the right condition, and you have alcohol as a result and the little CO2 bubbles, carbon dioxide. The cool part about sparkling wine is we trap those CO2 inside the bottle, and we get the result of these lovely cool feeling bubbles when we sip this wine. It's really a treat. Um, it looks good. I don't know if we, we didn't even take time to smell. We just went right for the sip because it's Wednesday. I totally get that. But sometimes uh, you can 
catch aromas more aggressively because the bubbles are bringing them out to you. Um, this is really attractive to look at. I may just take a little break and just look at my wine. No, I'm supposed to be doing some work here, so we'll keep moving. So the cool part about sparkling wine as a definition, we've trapped the CO2 inside the, the actual wine. Um, most winemaking CO2 is allowed to escape. Hopefully that is not why we're suffering from global warming. So what makes sparkling wines different around the world? That was my politically ecological joke for the evening. I hope you're ready for that. Thank you. I love the post smiling. It's excellent. Um, if the jokes don't seem good enough, please have more wine. Anyways, um, so here's my clever little uh, grape cluster. And the grape cluster is trying to tell you what makes each grape or each wine different or unique. Does anyone think of a particular sparkling wine when they think of bubbles? I think I hear you all saying champagne. Yeah, 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 I see a nodder. I got a nodder over there in cube number 4B. Excellent. So, um, and champagne is an amazing bubbly wine, um, but there are so many other choices. So champagne is a very particular process. So in my little circles here, you can see method as an important element. We're gonna try and cover a couple of these key points. So you can, maybe when you're at the liquor store, you'll feel a little more comfortable about reading the shelf. Um, I love reading the shelf at the wine store because it's, it's a great way to explore and then find the opportunity that you wanna bring home. It's really cool. So sparkling wines differ between the grapes they use, the way the winemakers work to put them together, they have different quality ratings. You can see that on the label, typically. They do come to a range of sweetnesses. Um, and then there are styles. Some are really brisk bubbles, some are softer bubbles. And of course, the place that they're made, because this is a really cool agricultural product, really can impact what we get in our glass. So dry to sweet. The cool part is the, the wines often communicate this right on the label. So I know for wine number one, it actually says that short little four letter word, brut, and that is a marker that this is on the dry style of bubbly wine. Um, you don't see as often the sweeter styles. Someone said people in the United States aren't crazy about sweetness. And I'm like, well, then they have not been to the local bakery lately because um, we definitely like our sweet. I've used a demi-sec in one of my wine classes and it's just amazing to watch the students lose their mind after something that's so tasty. They're like, where do we buy this? It's like, oh, yeah. So across the bottom of the slide, you see terms like brut, extra dry, demi-sec. It seems a little out of whack because dry is less dry than brut. But if you can keep remembering that brut is pretty much the driest style, you'll be able to pick out what you want. On the other side of the scale, demi-sec, demi, half, and sec meaning dry in French, means it's half dry or a little sweet. And they are lovely. So if you find a demi-sec, treat yourself. What makes our bubbles fun in other categories? I would highlight the grape types can be broad and varied. And as you travel the globe, um, you can find that there are so many different selections. And sometimes you'll find a grape that you're familiar with Sometimes you'll find a grape you're not. To me, one of the funnest parts about wines is it's exploration. I didn't even have to go to the airport to get to Spain. Well, this is California. Um, but I have a wine from Spain tonight. I have a wine from Italy tonight. And we didn't even have to go through customs. Awesome. So I know some people get intimidated by all the fancy names. I mean, I think we know Chardonnay. I'm not sure if you've tried the sparkling Moscato. It's often called Asti or named after the place that it's grown in Italy. It's dangerous because it's low alcohol, sweet and bubbly. And somehow the bottle empties really fast and that can be problematic. Um, Pinot Noir and Chardonnay are the king of the sparkling wine world. It's kind of weird to think that a red grape makes a white wine that has bubbles, but it's an amazing fact that we enjoy in our glass. If you are considering February uh, to, to enjoy Valentine's Day, I recommend this uh, little Italian grape in the top right corner called Brachetto. They make a sparkling rosé that's sweet. 
It's amazing with chocolate covered strawberries. So these are, this is the cool part about sparkling wine. There's so many choices and we don't always have to spend 50, $60 a bottle. We can find them at quite a reasonable price point. So we'll keep moving along. The two ways that bubbly wines are made, there are more than two, but I just focused on two. So let's see, wine number one and wine number two. So our wine from Spain and our wine from California, California and Spain. Spain is following the traditional method of doing a second fermentation in this bottle. And the bubbles get trapped. And then of course, we rescue the bubbles by removing the cork and enjoying the wine. With a wine that's gonna be a little more production oriented, they need to make a larger volume, they could actually do the second fermentation inside a tank. So in the bottle, it often takes the classic name method champenoise, or you hear the word traditional method. And then when it's in the tank, I've heard some people say tank method, but it, it sounds like a weird war game. Um, but the classic French name is Charmat or Cuvée Close. And tremendous quality, and I would say 99% of people would not be able to tell the difference between the production methods. So don't worry about it. Buy what you like and enjoy it. We keep these cold. I hope before you opened, you kept your bottles chilled. We always want our sparkling wine to be between 40 and 45 degrees. It helps to make the bubbles last longer and it makes it a little easier and safer to open. So place is kind of cool when we think of bubbly wine. And I'm, apparently I have a, an issue with the word cool. I think I've said it nine times tonight. So I'm going to keep working on that. Cool climates are what make bubbly wines really fun. Um, cool climates help to support the style. So Champagne as a winemaking zone was, is a very cool location. And so one wine style they made was the bubbly wine. It supported what their growing conditions were. So you see five flags on the slide. The leading sparkling wine producer in the world is Italy. And we're gonna find more of it in the cooler locations or the Northern part of Italy. Uh, number two, I would highlight is Spain. They make a tremendous amount of fabulous bubbles. And then of course, France, always well known for Champagne, but the deals are finding the sparkling wines in France that aren't labeled Champagne because they're not gonna bring that same price tag and you get the same quality, but at a better deal. And then of course you can hang out in the new world, which we like to do, and you can go ultimately gringo and enjoy some American sparkling wine. And what's awesome for us is we find it all over our country. We uh, have today a fabulous Californian, but 35 minutes from me here, we could go to Westport Rivers, Massachusetts and have a handcrafted sparkling wine that, um, it's amazing. I, I've had it in a pro tasting where it's paired up against champagne and the Westport rivers and the champagne are tasted blind side by side. 85% of the room couldn't tell which one was champagne. So the quality is pretty outrageous. And then Argentina from the Southern hemisphere is super well known for making some great sparkling wine. I think they're a little harder to find in our liquor store, but it's something cool to keep your eye out for. Cool, what's with cool? Must be the theme. So, bonjour, comment c'est bien, c'est bien, et bonjour messieurs et mesdames, c'est la nuit du champagne, right? So um, that's about where my vocabulary ends, and that's usually when I get in trouble with the French wine police. So I say bonjour because often bubbles are the start of the evening. Why? Why do we need something that got an intricate top that's difficult to open, can be dangerous? I think it's all in the bubbles. Did you know those little carbon dioxide guys or gals, they're probably neutral, but they get alcohol into our bloodstream faster than any other form of ethanol. So perfect for the beginning of a cocktail party when everybody's a little bit nervous, still a little uptight from work, the bubbles get us feeling a little more comfortable, a little more sociable and ready to chit chat. I think I need some more bubbles anyway. So champagne is probably the most best known, the most famous, the highest regarded sparkling wine in the world. 
a lot of people like to think they're the first ones to the game, but they were not. Um, however, bubbly wines are associated with starting in France. You can see in this picture, the sort of white soil in the background, that's really well suited for uh, Chardonnay. Um, chalky soils are really, really good for growing that kind of grape. When we think of Champagne, you should think of Chardonnay and Pinot Noir as your primary grape. Really cool place to go. But if you prefer a different cuisine, I could easily recommend Northeastern Italy. Only about 50 minutes, 60 minutes from uh, Venice or another hour and a half away from the city of Veneto where Romeo and Juliet got their game on, almost, maybe. And maybe they were drinking Prosecco up there. So Prosecco is a, a region, a famous place in Italy. And of course you can find bubbly wine in other parts of Italy, but this is probably uh, some of the most famous. Um, another region just west of Prosecco is something called Francia Corta. And it is the same quality level as champagne, it's super yummy. So Prosecco, so cool. It is a lovely little white wine from the hillsides and the pictures trying to get you the sense of these really neat hillsides around the northern part of Italy. And uh, they grow a really cool grape called Glera, G-L-E-R-A, Glera, which is funny. I've been teaching wine for about 20 years and 20 years ago, they didn't tell you it was Glera. They said, oh yeah, our grape for the Prosecco is Prosecco. I was like, yeah, right. And then somewhere over the past 15, 20 years, they're like, hold on, we have made a change to the winemaking. And uh, they told us the grape name is Glera. That's really cool. It's something you don't always see every day and you may not know that you're drinking a different grape when you have Prosecco. What's great about Prosecco compared to Champagne? The price. You can find a significant difference and if the price is different, you're probably going to be impacted because it's, uh, or you, you receive that price discount per se because the production method's different. The Prosecco people use a method called the Charmat or the tank method. And of course, it's a little more efficient and we reap the benefit, which is awesome. We can leave our fabulous friends in Italy and travel Southwest to the Iberian Peninsula and enjoy a sparkling wine called Cava. Uh, although Cava doesn't necessarily indicate in its translation, the word bubbles in any way, Cava is reflecting the place where you would store your bubbly wine, which is the cave. And we all have a cave somewhere in our house, right? Sometimes it's an electronic cave or some of us actually have an old cellar where you can store stuff. So Cava is the Spanish word that indicates you're getting a sparkly wine. So Cava is indicative of Spanish sparkling wine and it's not just one part of Spain. Um, Spain has numerous sparkling wine zones, but best known is the area called Catalonia, uh, which is near the city of Penedes or up near Barcelona. So you can get some good papas fritas that you can enjoy with your sparkling wine and life would be good. Um, it's just a half an hour ride outside of Barcelona if you want to visit some of the most famous sparkling uh, uh, cava makers in Spain. So next time we're able to travel, let's go to Barcelona. What's really fun or what I like, uh, one of my favorite things, these are all traditionally made. So that means they make the fermentation, the second fermentation in the bottle, which is really cool. Um, and it's still reasonably priced in a lot of cases. So I find Spain to be one of my value zones that I can count on. Um, besides that, you're gonna find some grapes that you maybe are not have experienced before. Don't be afraid of them, they're fun. Um, they're hard to say sometimes. There's ones called Chirello, Machaveo, um, Parayala. They're all really tasty. And you will also find some Chardonnay there. Uh, it does so well in bubbly wine, they've adopted it. And then there's our homeland, fabulous USA. We make a lot of bubbles. A lot of it, of course, comes from the most wine oriented state in the union, California. They make over 95% of the wine made in the United States. But uh, I would highlight California's cool growing zones like Carneros or Anderson Valley are some really cool spots to get great bubbly wine. However, if you're searching for deals, sometimes you don't have to go that far. 
Um, Westport Rivers, again, I highlighted. You might find some treats on Long Island. Um, fabulous deal coming out of New Mexico, a product called Gruit, and it's just so yummy. Um, there's so many choices. It doesn't hurt, hurt to just sort of shop and talk to your local wine dealer and say, hey, what's, what's really happening that you can put in, uh, in my wine basket as I step out of the store? Our rules, of course, in regards to production are a lot more flexible because we're not tied to 600, 500 years of tradition. So that allows us to play around. And I think that's kind of fun. So let's talk about our first selection. You opened up the barefoot, I presume, and that's what we're tasting. And when you taste, I usually start by looking at it. And if you opened it at the beginning of the presentation as I did, do you find you're still getting bubbles? I still have bubbles working up the glass. Sometimes it's relative to your glass, um, but uh, this is a really neat uh, glass vessel. And when I smell this, it makes me think of the green apple kind of characteristic or like unripe citrus, lemons, limes that I might get with a Chardonnay. What's really cool about Barefoot, A, it's an American made product. It's made by the largest winery in the world. So Gallo, Ernest and Julio Gallo is the producer of the Barefoot brand. And they have an amazing uh, winery in Modesto, California. And then they also have some fabulous wineries um, working up the West Coast of California. Look at that. Someone's trying to call me while I'm doing a presentation. That's just unacceptable. Don't they know we're drinking bubbly wine? Anyways. <clears throat> So uh, Gallo has been a partner of Johnson Wales for quite a long time. They have hosted us on fabulous trips to Santa Barbara, um, Monterey, and especially Sonoma County. And it's really a treat to taste their bubbles um, and experience what they bring to the game. This is a tremendous value, um, somewhere between seven and $11. It's very reasonable and it brings the game that you expect with bubbles. Nice, delicate finish with the bubbles. I've got good acidity, making me, um, and I know that's a wine word, or good crispness, if I want to put it into restaurant language, but um, makes me crave some crisp fried food, maybe a little calamari fritti, something delicate. Uh, if you're the oyster fan, sparkling wine is a great oyster partner. So I'm going to put that to the side. While we're opening up, while Lauren was giving us the intro, I also opened the other wines. So we're gonna leave the United States, which is, this one is Chardonnay based. And we're gonna step over to Spain. So I don't know if you have another bottle to open, but you can dive right in. I love seeing people run right off the screen, like, let me get my bottle, I'll be right back. I'm gonna use a smaller glass. It's a tasting glass that we use here in all our wine courses. Um, it's easier to handle and manipulate, and I'm just worried after I have more bubbles, might it be harder to manipulate the glasses. So I'm trying to be in control here. So I open this the same way, again, 45 degree angle, twist the bottom, gently control the cork so it doesn't launch on you. The second wine is called Bojigas Brut Cala, and it's also a Reserva, which has a, a particular designation in Spain. It means that it has been aged longer um, in the United States, reserve it, or the word reserve is just good marketing. It has no legal value. But in Europe, and especially Spain, it does have sort of legal value. So when we make bubbly wine, we put sugar with yeast inside an already made wine to create more carbon dioxide and more alcohol. So once the yeast is eaten the sugar, which takes about three weeks, the work is done, but some winemakers like to leave the bottle in contact with the yeast inside because it adds nuance and flavor. This is called resting on the lees. Lees are the dormant yeast cells. So this sat on the lees for 24 months. That's definitely a quality statement. And it's kind of amazing because it's also in the 11 to $15 range. So something that's a reserve. This family has been making wine for uh, since the 1300s. So I think they might have a little idea of what's going on, if you know what I mean. So I'm going to pour that right up. I don't know if you bought all three wines. 
I hope you have a wine stopper or sometimes I've actually placed saran wrap, wrapped it three or four times to keep the gas from escaping so that we can have bubbly wine with breakfast, which is always a good thing, or you could make your own personal mimosa. So if I were to compare these side by side, a little hard on a black counter, but um, the kava is a little richer in color. Is that better? So a um, little richer color, uh, hinting that it comes from a warm climate. And in the nose, there's this toasty or brioche character, bread-like stuff, which is really making you say, this sat with the yeast for a period of time. Um, so the Americans, a touch cleaner, more fruit-driven. And then when we go to Spain, a little bit more of that classic made-in-the-bottle style. Really, really inviting. Bright, fresh. The bread notes are there, a little bit of yeast character. Again, citrus takes the game. Different grapes, a little different um, winemaking procedure, then additional aging. So we're getting a whole nother value here, but we really didn't have to beat up our checkbook. I kind of like that. That's not a bad thing, especially around the holidays. So kava is quite a treat. Now you can find expensive kavas as, as you search around, um, but you can also find them at a good entry level point like this product. So kind of fun to play. So it, uh, Spain is lovely, but we can also go to Italy. I think you may have seen this label before. It's a pretty well-known Prosecco. Um, the Gallo folks also make a great Prosecco called La Marca, but this is the Mionetto Prosecco. Can you all just say, I want you to do your best Italian accent. I want a Mionetto. Oh, I'm sorry, you're all muted. Never mind, never mind. Oh, I'm oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, we're gonna need another glass here. Uh-oh, who's doing the unmuted? I like it. Me, sorry. Say Mignonetto. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Mionetto is always very easy to find in the store. They do this diagonal labeling. Um, they have a yellow, an orange, very easy to locate. And again, a great price point. So if this is Italian and Mionetto, what is it a grape? Holy mackerel, I can't glear ya. Sorry, glera, glera, get it? Anyone view it? Sorry. So we're gonna pour that away. So leaving Spain, where we're at the very southern edge of Europe, I think of warm climate, Mediterranean climate. Now we reach the northern part of Italy with the Prosecco, a little cooler climate. Um, and I can see just sitting on the counter, the Prosecco compared to the Cava, the Prosecco is lighter. It's not as dense uh, a gold. It's sort of a white gold. And again, that just hints that the fruit is, it grew in a cooler climate, a little less ripe. So should be a little sharper. Um, let's see what we get here. Wow, I can smell the soil. It makes me think of dusty chalk. I know you're all saying that. It's like, oh yeah, dusty chalk, it's right there. But then, oh wow, really cool floral, little flower blossoms, fresh peach, yummy stuff. I don't know how many of you like to, it's really cool what you get from your nose. But then of course, it's important to taste the wine. Totally different expression. Fresh, easy to drink, maybe a little less ripe. So it's got a little sharpness in the finish, but not a problem. Easy to drink, easy on the wallet, everybody's happy. So moving forward, apparently uh, I don't know how to move slides at the same time as I talk. So Prosecco, and I, I don't know if you noticed in the first slide with um, Barefoot, one of the funnest things about them is they all come bottled in these. You can get a normal size, large size, but you can also get the mini pack. Um, not bad. A little Prosecco in the koozie. Life is good. Could be great for those outdoor uh, voyages. So moving forward, you can drink bubbles just like this. That's awesome. 
And a lot of people like this. Just let me have the bubbly wine, let me sip and savor. But what else can we do? So it's, I think as a wine category, it gives you so much range to play. So if you don't finish your bottle tonight, no pressure, because you can save it and do something with it tomorrow or perhaps Friday, uh, as long as you're trying to keep those CO2 bubbles in. Um, at your local wine store, you may be able to find some kind of cap that has a hinge and a cork top. So let's get this arranged here. And I have another one from the Jakar people, but the, the top goes in and then the little arm holds it on top. So your bubbles stay in and it remains under pressure. Totally worth the two bucks or three bucks or four bucks that this is costing you because A, you won't feel forced because we're not twisting anyone's arm here to drink the whole bottle in the next 20 minutes because uh, that would be problematic. But um, it gives you the ability to really enjoy this wine for a couple days. And of course you'd keep that refrigerated. Um, so go to your liquor store, get a sparkling wine stopper. Very, very important. So let me take that out because I think I'm gonna use this wine again. So what else can we do with bubbles? So I think this is called wine math. If you take bubbles plus juices, liqueurs, spirits, or the world famous, so popular shrubs. What? Shrubs? This is not a gardening class. What is happening here? Anyways, I'll get the shrubs in a minute. You all know about juice, right? Coming from the old citrus fruit. I don't know if you can see that. So, of course, you can buy fresh squeezed juice at the grocery store, or you can get your little juicer, pop it right in, squeeze. One of the most famous drinks in regards to bubbly wine. Let's see what we've got here. I mean, more famous than maybe the Bellini. I think you all are pretty familiar with the Mimosa. Fresh orange and a little bit of Prosecco and you've got a happy place. But maybe you're tired of the Mr. Old Orange. You want something a little different. So on the screen is your Bellini recipe. It's really a cool drink. Um, just some fresh peaches. And even in the winter, when you're saying fresh peach, what are we talking about? I'm living up in the Northeast here. It's wicked cold. I can't find a freaking peach. Go to the freezer section, get the frozen peaches. Yes. Your store is your friend. Mash the peaches, muddle them with a little bit of sugar, tiny bit of lemon juice and make a peach puree, put it inside your glass and life is good. I'm going to cheat. What do I have here? I have the big bottle and the little bottle. This is Mianetto. I'm not, not Mianetto. <laughs> it is not bubbly wine. This is a syrup. Apparently I haven't, uh, I've had a little bit of wine. But anyways, just a quick example of, there's my Prosecco. You can see that, correct? And then I put a little bit of syrup in this is Monin, a fabulous company from France. And if you need to give it a little, where's my magic stirring spoon? I'm gonna blend my syrup and my wine. Whenever you're doing it, you're only doing about a tablespoon. You don't need a large amount because you don't wanna get rid of the base character of the sparkling wine. You still want a little bit of fruit, just to enhance it. Um, and because this was a sweetener, it took away a little bit of that bitter finish that was on the, on the Prosecco. And again, you can tailor it to whatever event you're having or whatever theme of the day you're having and have a lot of fun with that. So besides juice, you can also use a liqueur. So some liqueurs you might be familiar with, the lovely Grand Marnier orange flavored brandy. Oranges from Haiti are combined with cognac and they form this amazing liqueur. I have a homemade German berry liqueur. Whenever traveling, it's always fun to pick up something you need. And then even more fun, elderflower liqueur called Saint Germain. I don't know if you're familiar with Saint Germain, 
but actually on the Saint Germain uh, spirit package, they were liqueur package. They have a recipe on the side of the container uh, highlighting Prosecco, Saint Germain, and a little bit of um, club soda. And it just, it's a dangerous drink. If you make it by the pitcher, your friends will never leave. Um, it's kind of powerful. So again, it's just a small amount, a tablespoon, uh, half an ounce to an ounce, depending on how sweet or intense you want the flavor. You add this to your glass and pour your choice of bubbles on top. And it, it's really a treat. Uh, I was in a wedding with a dear friend, uh, a fellow grad from Jay Wu. And um, I think the maitre d' was nervous that the mom was a little intense. He snuck Grand Marnier in every little sparkling wine glass she had that night. That was the easiest mother of the bride that maitre d' had ever dealt with. It was so funny. At one point, she, I think she leaned on my shoulder. Uh, I can't tell you about that. Anyways, <clears throat> TMI, baby, TMI. So bubbles and a liqueur. And, and on the slide, I'm highlighting the most famous sort of bubbles liqueur mixture. It's called a Cure Royale. Um, it's just, I know people may not have creme de cassis sitting at home. Creme de cassis is an awesome black currant liqueur. But what I was trying to identify is that you can substitute. You could buy the little small bottle or you can buy the bigger bottle and you can have fun at home mixing your bubbles with a cool liqueur. I'm watching my time because it's almost 7.15. A lot of people use, um, I mean, they're really cool classic cocktails. The French 75 um, is an example where any one of our sparkling wines, you know, they've got bubbles in them. So they add spritz to um, any drink. So when a drink is asking, or a drink recipe is highlighting that it wants a spritz, I think it's really cool to get away from thinking of club soda. Everybody thinks club soda or tonic, but if you've got the stopper and you've got the right sparkling wine, this is a whole nother way to add spritz to your cocktails. So don't be afraid of exploring that. Last but not least, we have to talk about the garden. The shrub. Oh my God, he brought a small bottle with cloudy liquid. He's gonna make us drink that, oh hell. So that cloudy liquid was this fruit. And where's my little plate? I hid my plate for myself. What I did is I cut up lemon, uh, yellow grapefruit, and orange, and put in clove, cardamom, and cinnamon stick. Placed it in a container with equal parts apple cider vinegar and granulated sugar. So the classic recipe, as you see on the slide, um, if I move the slide, is one cup cider vinegar, one cup sugar, and then whatever your flavoring elements are. They don't have to be citrus. Uh, the great part about a shrub is that you are taking product that might be in your refrigerator, some fruit that maybe, oh, it got lost behind that large piece of prime rib. I couldn't see the fruit, it got stuck, and it's just starting to get a little old. Put it in this mixture and you revitalize it and you extract all the cool flavors and aromas that you could then strain into your magic bottle mixture and your neighbors are like, oh dude, he's breaking out the magic bottle again. It could be trouble. And very similar to what we did with the liqueur, I'm gonna go gringo, do a little barefoot. We'll go for the adult portion. And then again, this, this shrub is sour because of the vinegar, but the sugar balances that. So it's a sweet and sour base and then what's really awesome is the flavors that you've extracted now if you leave the the skin on the fruit of course you're going to get some bitter but it also brings more aroma so i'm going to put a little bit of this right in and then if i want to just counterbalance i can take a little trick from my bar some angostura bitters this is an orange flavored angostura bitters and put a drop or two on top and you've got an inexpensive bubbly wonderland that could cause trouble. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna go for a minute, just me and this glass, I'll be back and just, no. 
what's cool is the bubbles take the flavors of what you marinated and sort of elevate them, but you're also getting the flavor of the, a little bit of the sweetness from the cider vinegar blending. So it's really a fun treat that you can customize um, and make your winter even more fun. So it's that time, Lauren. Awesome, thank you so much. This is so <laughs> exciting. And um, we have a good amount of time for questions. So if you have any questions for Mark, um, he has a wealth of knowledge as you hear. So whatever questions you have about sparkling wine, feel free to put them in the chat and we can answer them as they come in. All right, first question from Amy. Do bubbly wines have sulfates the same as still wine? So I know, um, especially in the United States, it's required by law, but most countries require that the, the, the winemaker indicates whether sulfites uh, were in the wine. So sulfur is a chemical, it's a natural occurring chemical, so you could even find it in organic wine, but it's, it's useful to the winemaker right after the fruit has been picked. So in that period of time where you've gone from the vineyard and you're trying to get into the winery to, um, you know, crush your fruit and make your wine, you want to protect it from the evil one, which is oxygen. And sulfur helps to keep, you know, because sulfur is heavier than oxygen, it creates a sort of bed above the fruit or above the wine to protect from oxygen impacting and pre-aging or pre-impacting our wine before it's finished. So just like traditional winemaking, you would find these may have sulfites in them. I know some people have some allergies with that and that's always a bummer. Good to be aware. Um, so we have a request to share the PowerPoint and we can, um, with Mark's permission, share the PowerPoint and have the really great information on there in the follow-up emails. Um, sure. So be sure to look with that. And we can we share it as a PDF, we can share it as a PowerPoint. There are so many choices. So many choices. And the recording will be in the follow-up so you will see it there sure. as well. Uh, Robin is asking about the ratio for bubbles to shrubs. The ratio of? Bubbles to shrubs. Okay, I think it's the same. Um, again, you're, when you're doing this at home, it's totally up to your taste. But the baseline, uh, if I, if I can see if I can go backwards. No, I can't go backwards. But typically I'm doing, if I am, so this is probably a seven to eight ounce sparkling wine glass. So I would say no higher than this amount, approximately an ounce to half an ounce, somewhere in that range. But then again, if uh, your shrub is light, you might need a little bit more. So you have to taste each product separately and then sort of work out your mix. I'm usually, I'm, I'm going one part shrub to seven parts sparkling wine there. Uh, another question, uh, Mickey is wondering, what are some good ideas for food or appetizers to pair with champagne and or sparkling wine? I'm sorry, you should never eat food with wine. That's just insane. I cannot handle these kind of questions. It's over people. So, so <laughs> the way I approach wine and food pairing, first of all, just like structurally, if you think about what you're drinking, so take a sip of your sparkling wine, go, go real quick and ask yourself, is it light intensity or is it really powerful intensity? So if it's light, hold up one finger. If it's powerful, hold up your whole hand. All right, some, oh wow, I got a whole hand there. Oh my God, cool. So generally, sparkling wines are considered on the lighter range. So the first step I like to take in regards to food and wine pairing is match intensities. So if I was gonna have this with um, you know, um, a short rib that's roasted for eight hours and slowly braised, that's just gonna overpower the wine. So sparkling wines, starting in the light category, I'm gonna go for lighter style foods. So I mentioned the um, calamari fritti, um, not necessarily with tomato sauce, but it, it could work. I mean, I know that's how the rest of the world does it, but in Rhode Island with the, the peppers, and a little bit of uh, lemon juice. Um, oysters, because they bring lightness in food, but they also bring a briny, salty character that blends really well with champagne, as well um, the minerality that an oyster has matches the minerality that might be inside the actual champagne. So I always try to go for intensity, lighter foods with lighter wines. 
And then want, uh, foods that have any bit of sourness or a little bit of saltiness are much easier to pair than foods that are sweet or that are bitter. Great. Uh, Tamara is wondering for the shrub, do you use all three citrus, orange, lemon, and lime? And what is your favorite recipe to use the shrub in? So <laughs> my colleague, Linda Patine, who teaches the spirit classes and wine classes here, she is a shrubaholic. I'm calling people to help her. I'm worried that every time she's like at Whole Foods, she gets arrested for taking excessive fruit for shrub experimentation. I am so worried about my colleague, but I have caught her disease. Ah, it's amazing. So I'm totally playing. I did not know the grapefruit I had at home was a yellow grapefruit. I prefer rubies. Um, and I only did lemon and orange. So there's a lot of similarity here. Um, I asked my students in the spirits class to often taste uh, lime, lemon, and orange, just like a slice of each to evaluate the sourness. Um, but uh, I didn't have any lime here. So I think I would have preferred orange, lemon, and lime. And you have to, again, be careful about the amount of time that it sits. So this sat in my fridge at home. I did it last night. Um, so it probably sat for 18 hours. And again, up front, the sweetness comes out. And I could have been more aggressive and used a muddler to try and squeeze some of the juice while it was all combined with the, the recipe. Um, this time I did not. So I think the bitter pith took over a little bit and leaves me with a little bit of a, a sort of a struggle between sweet, sour, and bitter. But uh, you could do this with apples, especially if you like cinnamon and, and clove. Um, you can do this with um, raspberries, strawberries. It's amazing how much color you'll get from a blackberry. So that will also change what your wine looks like. And there's tons of stuff online. And I didn't even mention tossing in herbs. But um, again, you want to be cautious about how long you soak, because the longer you soak, the more you extract. And there's there's a sweet spot in there. Great. I hope that was an answer. Yeah, Linda is actually on, on the session. So she heard your praise of shrubbery appreciation. Um, and we have some requests for you to do um, other wine tasting so we can connect Kate with you after this. Um, and one other question that is coming in, what is your favorite sparkling wine out of the three that we sampled tonight? Oh, uh, wow. Um, I, it, it, again, it's, it's so much of it is like mood based or like, what do, you, what do you feel like drinking right now? So let me see if I can go back to so that is the Cava, and it's not fair. My last name is De Marchena, and everybody's like, oh, you're Italian. And I'm like, no, I'm not Italian. And they're like, Marchena is a little city in the southern part of Spain in a region called Andalusia. And um, so sometimes stuff with a Spanish hint makes me lean. Um, so I love this Cava. Um, I think it's such a great value. But then my wife and I went to uh, Veneto and that was an awesome trip. And like, oh, I didn't get to where they make the Prosecco. And I'm sort of bummed about that. And I just love our relationship with Gallo. So it's hard to pick. So for my mood right now, I'm jamming on the Kava. Awesome. All right, we have a question for about one time for one or two more questions. So if there's any other questions looming. I don't know. I, I think I don't have any information left. <laughs> Your brain is just uh, full of wonderful information. Hold on. Let me run to my office. I'll get a whiteboard. <laughs> um, but we have some really great praise coming in, and everyone is really enjoying this session. So thank you, Mark, for your time tonight and your festive attire and uh, setup. So I'm going to throw it back over to Lori Zabata, the Director of Alumni Relations, uh, and she will close us out for this evening. Happy holidays, everyone. Thanks, Lauren, and thank you, Professor DiMartena, for such an informative discussion about sparkling wine options and the ways to enhance them should one choose to do so. You certainly have prepared us for the upcoming new year. Your beverage knowledge is always impressive, and your delivery makes learning enjoyable, comfortable, and entertaining, not to mention your sense of humor and use of accents. Tonight, we even got to hear you speak French. That was such a treat. We're grateful to you for sharing your time with us and appreciate all that you've offered us in this session, so thank you. 
I'd like to thank the alumni relations team for their help behind the scenes, especially Lauren Anderson for her work to bring this program to us. I'd also like to thank all of our alumni attendees for joining us for this festive session. It was such a pleasure to see you enjoy this presentation in the comfort of your home. Professor DiMarchena is an amazing example of the faculty providing the world-class education that our students receive at the College of Food Innovation and Technology, or CFIT. You can help support tomorrow's culinary leaders today with a donation to support CFIT, but your gift is more than a donation. The simple act of giving any amount actually contributes to the growth of JWU's reputation, our rankings and ratings. You can boost JWU's standing by giving each and every year to the university, which increases the value of your degree and makes alumni even more sought after by employers. Thanks to a generous donation from trustee and parent Dave Wilson, all gifts will be matched up to $100,000 until December 31st. If you're in a position to help us meet that challenge, I ask that you consider to do so. That is the power of collective giving. We've included a link in the chat for your convenience. On behalf of our students, I thank you for your generosity. We sincerely hope that you enjoyed this evening's session, Sip with JWU, Prepping for a New Year with Bubbly, part of the JWU for You family of programming. Through JWU for You, alumni can engage in informative and interesting discussions related to professional development, social and avid interest topics. Join us in January for another Sip with JWU session with more details forthcoming. For the full listing of upcoming events and more information, please visit our events calendar at alumni.jwu.edu. We appreciate your attendance and wish you a healthy and happy holiday season and new year. Cheers to 2021. Have a great night.